In the first video of this series, we introduced COSIM and discussed the detail of our model, which seeks to reflect a hypothetical school with 500 students. In this video, we'll discuss the results of that model and what those results imply for decision makers. Here are our school results across a few graphs for our three different settings, elementary school, middle school, and high school. Let's walk through what's happening on these graphs before we try to interpret them. The x-axis represents the number of days since the start of the semester. The y-axis represents the fraction of susceptible students who become infected throughout the semester. For a population of 500 and an incoming protection of 30%, the semester begins with 350 susceptible students. If 35 of these students became infected, the trend would reach 10% on the y-axis. The no masking scenarios reflect disease spread with an effective reproductive rate of four, which means for every one person infected, four other students become infected. This is a conservative estimate for the spread of COVID-19's Delta variant, as some estimates range from five to eight. That is for every one person infected, anywhere between five and eight people become infected. The universal masking scenarios reflect an effective reproductive rate of two, representing a 50% reduction in transmission from masking. For both masking policies, two testing options are possible. Either no testing or randomly testing half of students every week. What do these graphs reveal? Let's first focus on that middle panel. Assuming 40% incoming protection and no testing, and the absence of masking, 80% of susceptible students will become infected after just two months. This is the worst case scenario and it demonstrates the power of exponential growth amidst the Delta variant. If the school randomly tested half of its students every week, not only 60% of susceptible students would become infected. The impact of masking is even more profound. If, along with testing students, the school implemented universal masking, total infections are estimated to decrease all the way to 10% of susceptible students. Disease spread is dependent on the amount of an incoming protection as well. For the scenario we just discussed, the percentage of susceptible students who become infected increases to 15% when only 30% have incoming protection and decreases to 70% if, only, if up to 50% have incoming protection. What does this look like for our 500 students? Here we see the total number of new infections at the end of the semester across all scenarios. As an example, Let's again consider a middle school setting. In the absence of testing and universal masking, 255 new infections will occur throughout the semester. Implementing both universal masking and testing can prevent roughly 80% of these infections, bringing the total number of new infections down to 60. Even in the absence of masking, testing can help. A shift from no testing to testing one, -third, one half of students can prevent roughly 10% of new infections. In the absence of testing, masking alone can prevent roughly 60% of new infection. The situation is even more troubling when the R0, or reproductive rate, is increased to 5, which may happen as the Delta variant becomes even more dominant in the population. If the same middle school remained without testing or universal masking, upwards of 333 new infections will occur throughout the semester. So what to make of all this? Even with conservative estimates for the Delta variant's reproductive rate and a minimal number of infections coming from outside the school, our model estimates a significant number of within school infections in the absence of masking and testing, upwards of 90% of susceptible students becoming infected by the end of the semester in a setting with just 30% incoming protection. The good news is that the combination of masking and testing can prevent as much as 70% of these potential infections. It's also important to note that new infections among students have implications that we have not modeled, ones that go beyond the classroom. Many of those who are infected will both experience multiple missed school days and may likely transmit the virus to their parents and grandparents, resulting in additional hospitalizations or deaths in the community. The link between Delta and long COVID or multi-inflammatory syndrome is also unknown. The risk of the most severe disease is lower among children but may still exist. Finally, as school-based infections become too great, schools will likely return to virtual learning. As many have experienced personally, virtual learning is far from ideal 
has been associated with poor mental health outcomes among students and limited learning gains. And for those parents fearful of the children returning to in-person classrooms, it is important to recall that if, student, if a student were to get infected, their likelihood of experiencing severe disease is minimal. The clearest solution is to encourage universal masking and, where resources are available, to frequently test students and isolate those who are infected appropriately. Children belong back in the classroom. Masks and testing can ensure this is a safe space for all.